Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Intro to Butterflies, with Betsy Bitros. Uh, my name is Brooke Widmar, and I'm the Director of Administrative Operations and Member Engagement for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I want to thank all of you for joining us for this webinar today. Uh, during the webinar, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your screen. And at the end, Carol will come on to read those out to Betsy. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and a link will be shared with all of you tomorrow along with any resources um, and links mentioned during the presentation. So to introduce today's speaker, um, Betsy's lifelong love of insects began in childhood. Uh, and then she went on to earn a degree in entomology from Colorado State University, focusing mostly on aquatic insects. She worked for 30 five years for the environmental department of Johnson County in Kansas and worked to earn a master's degree from Kansas University in environmental health. She taught environmental science for 15 years part-time at Johnson County Community College and somehow found time to write a book on the butterflies of the Kansas City region, which was published in 2008. In her retirement, uh, Betsy studies and photographs invertebrates on her five acres of land. So far, she has submitted more than 4,000 of her images to bugguide.net, including several rare species. So without further ado, take it away, Betsy. Okay, well, thank you all for uh, zooming in. Uh, these are always a challenge because all I'm seeing is a little camera. So hopefully I'll keep looking at it. So yeah, so we're gonna do local color, butterflies of the Kansas City region. And yes, I did write a book and it's certainly the most comprehensive book for the Kansas City area, just to put a plug in. Actually I put a few more plugins at the end. So getting right on into the slideshow. Um, and I don't know where everybody's from, but I'm, I'm just gonna be talking of this as being in the Kansas City region. <clears throat> but in Kansas City, we're located between two major ecological biomes. To the west, on the Kansas side, we have the tall grass prairie, and to the east, we've got the eastern deciduous forest that has all the leaves that fall off in the winter. So these are two major biomes, and but even within our states, I don't have these labeled, but uh, these are all different varying ecosystems in each state. Uh, so the state's even subdivided in even more. But for us as a bug, bug lookers or birders, uh, it provides a good uh, good spot because we get the best of both ecosystems. So uh, just briefly here, a little, eco, little um, ecology. So <clears throat> when we're, we're trying to define an ecosystem or a biome, we think of it as a biological community. And that's, that's the populations of all the organisms in that area. And you look at that, the biological community is then also activating um, and interacting with the physical environment. And the physical environment is climate, water, nutrients, soil, and sunlight. So it's mutually supported, the, ecos the ecosystem, the community, by the exchange of matter and energy throughout the biological part and getting it from the physical part. And so ecosystems are based on, they're distributed, they just don't occur just everywhere because it depends on the climate, the topography, and the soils. But you generally characterize an ecosystem by the green stuff. Since all the critters elsewhere that live on that area are based on eating things that ate the plants. So <clears throat> this, is all, this is a remnant tall grass prairie. <clears throat> oh, rooms over there. Uh, so the tall grass prairie is characterized by tall grass, the eastern deciduous forest, eastern deciduous forest. So it's characterized by all that. And still, you still wind up going back to the distribution based on climate, topography, and soils. <clears throat> so if, you, if you're looking at a biosystem or a biome or ecosystem, like I just said, there's major groupings like the deciduous forest, but even when the deciduous forest, there's different types of deciduous forest. You go Northeast United States, now you have maple and birch type trees as the, as the kind of the that define the climax environment, that's what grows. You have deserts and you have different types of deserts. <clears throat> we have rainforests and there's different types of rainforest, grasslands, different types, and the taiga, which is the Northern Coniferous Forest. So when you think about some, trying to figure out, like you may just be going out to look for butterflies, which is fine. <laughs> I want to give you a little bit of perspective here. So how do you know the health of a ecosystem? 
Well, there's lots and lots of ways to measure that, but there's the three major things you're looking for is the diversity of organisms, the productivity, how many are being produced, and the resilience, because any ecosystem has to be able to recover from a major natural disaster or some human bit of stupidity. But <laughs> So they have to have resilience and some ecosystems are more resilient than others because you might think of the tropical rainforest going, wow, this huge, thick forest. Um, they must just grow and grow and grow. But what happens in the um, tropical rainforest is that since you have sunshine and relatively warmth uh, and moisture year round, nothing stays dead long. So when leaves fall to the ground, they're, they're immediately being eaten by uh, de decomposers. So what that means is that there's very, very poor soil. They don't have the topsoil we have in the Midwest, which makes us the big corn belt, wheat belt of the world. Uh, they don't have that. And so when you do massive lumbering in those, 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 those rainforests, you, don't, you may get trees to grow back for a couple of years, but chances are they're not going to grow another forest because you basically have created a, a concrete to grow in. But anyway, so here we go. So relative to butterflies, well, different species, we got lots of different species of butterflies and they exist based on the availability of the food plant, that is whatever the caterpillars feed on. And those plants are dependent on the climate, topography and soils. So <clears throat> when you're talking about climate, climate's not just that it's raining today and sunny tomorrow. It's the long-term weather patterns. And so species existing in an ecosystem, if they're there year round, they have adapted to the physical conditions of that ecosystem. Uh, but they might be adapted to survive just summers. And so they come up here and they migrate here from Southern and Southwest part of the United States. And they're here just for the summer and then they die off with the exception of the monarch. So they have to have an exit strategy if they can't adapt to the physical environment. And organisms are always pushing the envelope to move into other ecosystems. It's like possums in the Kansas City area. We're almost the northern extreme of those because they have adapted, but they haven't totally adapted because they don't grow uh, warm uh, insulating fur in the winter. So if you have a severe cold break in Kansas City, you're going to have a lot of dead possums unless they're living in your garage. So things are either going to migrate out of here, they're going to, there's going to be a certain life stage that stays over, uh, they might go dormant, and they might just die off. So uh, this is the painted lady. <clears throat> this is a, a, has a huge distribution. It's here in, in the Kansas City area, but it's only here in the summer. It's not adapted to winter. But it's, it's interesting, it's, it lives everywhere except South America, which is a pretty big place, and Antarctica, which, which of course, I mean, not much lives there anyway. Uh, but some years you'll have, a, you'll have eruptive years, which is there's just been a lot growing in the South and they start moving North and you just get a lot. But they do reproduce here. They do eat, they eat the caterpillars eat thistles and reproduce. So, but uh, they don't survive, they only survive summer. So they immigrate out of here to the summer Southern states, but they don't have a full migration. Then we have another example. This is the dainty sulfur. This is a little tiny sulfur. You'll learn more about what all those mean. They're only here in the summer. And these little guys migrate from the Southern or immigrate from the Southern states. And before the end of summer in Kansas, at least, they actually are occupying every single county in Kansas. So this little teeny tiny butterfly coming from the south grows really well in the summer, and then, but it doesn't overwinter, so it dies off. Uh, it's very successful in that the caterpillars feed on various aster plants, which we got lots of those, and uh, something called uh, carpet weed, <coughs> they also eat. So. Then we have an example of the angle wing type butterflies, and they are resident species in our area, but they overwinter as the adult. So the adult has to, they change their chemistry a little, they have to find warm spots to, or places to hide out for the winter. But on a warm day in, in the winter, uh, they'll come out because they don't depend on flowers for their food source. 
these guys like they like the the sap the scat which is the animal poop rotting fruit and they like all that uh, rather than nectaring so these guys can live all winter and hibernate and then come out early and get going so some of the other uh, butterfly uh, survival strategies whoops so um some of the overwintering strategy strategies of our butterflies uh, we have the this list, these are, are, are some examples of butterflies that overwinter in the caterpillar stage. And we'll be going over these in more detail. The fritillaries, this is the uh, viceroy, uh, northern pearly eye, and least skipper. So it's interesting to think that they're surviving, their little caterpillars survive all winter. And I suppose a lot die, but somehow they've adapted that way. Now, some of our species, especially some of our bigger ones like the, the swallowtails, uh, overwinter in the, the pupa or the chrysalis stage. With butterflies, we call the pupa the chrysalis, and moths, it's just a pupa. So these all overwinter as the chrysalis or pupa. So if you're ever into raising butterflies, you need to know about their overwintering strategies. And what you don't want is they overwinter, overwinter here, you don't want to overwinter them in your nice 70 degree house all winter because they will emerge uh, very early and be disappointed there's no flowers. So this is a, some of the, these are some hair streaks that overwinter in the egg, egg, verse, egg form. And then the buckeye, the sachem skipper, monarch, and uh, cloudless sulfur, that uh, these all die off or, or exit the area. So worldwide, it's estimated there are more than 150,000 species of Lepidoptera, and that includes butterflies and moths. And of that 150,000, only about 20,000 are butterflies. The rest are moths. So a lot of people that have done a lot of studying of butterflies have converted to moths because it's an endless amount of moths to go chasing for and learning and identifying new ones. So if you really want to see a rich diversity of insects, plants, it's in the tropics, which, which is around the equator. So if you get a chance to go south and um, then you get the opportunities of seeing you know, incredible butterflies, other insects, the vegetation, the flowers, all that stuff that's really, really incredible. So in the United States and Canada, uh, we have about 725 species, 700, 725. Uh, part, northern part of Mexico is part of North America. So when I say North America, North of Mexico, the reason why is because when you start going down into Mexico, the number of species increases dramatically. So that can be overwhelming. So for our work, we're, we're focusing on the United States and Canada, uh, about 725 species. So in naming and identify, it's one thing to identify an insect or a tree plant with a, uh, a name like the red bud, or the walnut tree, or the swallowtail butterfly, but how do you talk to other groups of people around the world about this, the swallowtail butterfly? Which one you don't? It, that doesn't tell them much. So, plants and animals are group, grouped in what we call hierarchies, and it's they're grouped originally. They're grouped because of similar relatedness. They have characteristics that are similar. They get clumped together. Swallowtail butterflies. They have long tails the family nymphality, brush-footed, the little front feet are up here, and they have four legs that they walk on. And so this use in similar form and structure has guided this classification. And you, you make the belief that with shared characteristics and there's an, a common ancestor to look backwards on. That's what I, not I do when I collect butterflies, but it's there. Um, <clears throat> DNA analysis is rapidly changing this along with more detailed evaluation of structure. So uh, a lot of names are starting to change because it's, it's related to this genus, not that genus, or it's related to that family, not the other family, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's a whole world that I don't understand, but whenever they say that names are changed, good. So one of the big things happened is when I was in college, we had, uh, the uh, insecta, insects, but then there were three groups in the insects that at some point in time, they realized really weren't related to directly to insects and various reasons how they feed and reproduce it, et cetera. 
So uh, what's called a subphylum, they got put in what's called hexapoda, which is hex, six, poda, legs, feet. So now we have insecta and then all the others, which I'll show up in here. So that, that is what I'm starting to talk about hierarchy. Hopefully you're not falling asleep with it, but here it is. We're all animals, we're animals, just like an insect is an animal. So we have classified them in arthropoda, and that includes all the insects, the spiders, the millipedes, centipedes, and crustaceans. So there's various subphylums under there, but the one we're interested in is the one that goes to the butterflies eventually. So it's hexapoda, and we got hexa or insecta. And springtails are real common. That's the type of little bug you've probably seen in your plants, and they literally spring all over the place. Uh, the other two, the Proturin and Diplura, probably you'll never, you'll never see those. That's something specialized to find. Oops, I forgot, I got arrows to go here. Here we go. <coughs> okay, but within an order, so then you have an order. So beetles are Coleoptera, flies are Diptera, butterflies are Lepidoptera, dragonflies are Odonata, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then, th then you start narrowing it down, you're splitting it apart more and more by clumping uh, in what we is referred to as family. So um, uh, like you got, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank there. Uh, like Cerambicidae, which are longhorn wood borers. I'll start with that one. Uh, that's a family of beetles. And there's lots of families in each one of the orders. So, and we look at the family thing, again, shared characteristics. And then ultimately we get down to genus species. And this is the big thing that has changed was a big change in science. And what it is, is that back in the 1700s, Carl Linnaeus introduced a, a binomial nomenclature. So every organism and plant that's identified is ultimately classified with a genus and species name, like we're Homo sapiens. So genus of Homo sapiens is species. Well, he was a, quite a busy boy. <laughs> He was a botanist, a physician, and a zoologist. And he formalized this binomial nomenclature. And since the 1700s, it is, has remained the same of how we name organisms. And apparently he was very, he was the father of the modern taxonomy and one of the most acclaimed scientists in the world at the time that he lived. So Linnaeus, and he published uh, this in, um, this book here, what is Systema Natura. And this was published in two volumes, 1758 and 1759. And within it, he's identified lots of lots of lots of critters and introduced the concept of the binomial system. And this was not new to him because he'd actually already done it for plants. Plants got ahead of the bugs. So anyway, no, uh, what is a species varies uh, with uh, depending on what research person you are or whatever, because <laughs> there's at least 25 definitions of what a species is. And what I use and is more common used is that a species is once you get a species, only other individuals that look like those species can mate, lay eggs and produce viable offspring. That is that they, those, the offspring can mate and produce eggs. And there are other twist of that, but that's what we're using. Uh, that's what I'm using. That's the commonest thing. So then thinking about Linnaeus back in the 1700s, um, well, you see the names, the scientific names, like it's Danis Plexippus. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing it right. And if you're writing it out correctly, you actually write out who described the species and, and it has to be described and published. So it can be open for uh, review. In this case, you see that, oh, here it is. You got parentheses around Linnaeus, comma, 1758. So what does that mean? Well, that actually means that Linnaeus, he described it and named the monarch butterfly back in the 1750s. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and the parentheses, though, say that since that it was reassigned to another genus, because he actually named those uh, Pep Papilio was, I think, about all the butterflies. So it was changed. However, we'll take an example of the Eastern tiger swallowtail, Papilio, it, the swallowtails retain, he, uh, have been retained with the Papilio name. And you see Linnaeus, 1758, but nothing around it. 
And that means it hasn't changed since the 1758 when he published his work that described that species. But then you get some, some you'll see that have more, more, uh, more things in them. And this one is a butterfly called the sleeping orange. And a person named Kramer originally described the species, uh, but what, whatever he published them in, nobody could find. I mean, whatever, lots of stuff gets lost in time. So these brackets here simply say that it's believed that that bug was identified in 1779. So probably more than you want to know, but it's, it's actually very useful. <laughs> and this whole process, now I can't go out and pull a bug out of my prairie and go, oh, I, I like you. I'm going to name you, you know, sweetheart, glistening grasshopper or something. I'm going to name you a new species. Um, I can do that. I can try to publish it. It's not going to go anywhere. There is an international commission of zoological nomenclature. It's a, not a government group, but these over, these over uh, and there's also one for plants. They oversee the process through which species are, are uh, assigned. And just a real quick one on here. Believe it or not, that when you're describing a new species, you have exactly one individual. And in the past, it used to be a male. I have no idea why. But that one individual, so the description that we apply for all the other individuals we see is based on this holotype. And literally described from one, one specimen. And it's called a holotype. And that's supposed to be uh, placed in a museum, natural history museum or something uh, as a way to keep it recorded. And lots of them are still there. I mean, lots of Linnaeus is, uh, pin specimens are still in the museums, still exist. So for example, Linnaeus, uh, he was a type specimen for, for us, holotype, homo sapiens, uh, because uh, he was the sole specimen that he is known to have examined himself. So ugh, yes, it's kind of amazing. So Lepidoptera of butterflies means scale wings. Uh, terra, uh, terra always means um, a wing. So uh, the scale, if you, if you look here, this is under electron mic microscope. And uh, let's see, blow this up. Oh, no, I didn't take that out of it. Oh, well, it's on, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but when you touch a butterfly or moth wing and you, you get all that dust on you, and you think, oh, the poor thing's not gonna be able to fly. Actually, they can fly quite well. But it's just like shingles on a roof is how the scales are, are on, on the wings and the, uh, the butterfly or moth. Let's get out of that. Okay, now we're back here. So we again, this is kind of repeating what I just said, some 13,000 described species of moths and some 700 plus North, uh, North America. Nobody really knows where the name butterfly or moth came from, which is kind of disappointing. That's never been figured out. No, oh, there, let's go on. So is it a butterfly or is it a moth? That's always kind of the first question the person gets. And usually butterflies, uh, they usually fly during the day. Sometimes they fly at night. This is a common wood nymph that came to my black light when you're, um, uh, I do a lot of what's called black lighting where I set up a sheet and black lights to attract insects at night because uh, they can see ultraviolet, we can't, but they are attracted to it. And lots of them just come and hang out on the sheet, makes, making it really easy for photography. And I do every once in a while get uh, butterflies. I've got dragonflies, damselflies, and they must have just gone to roost nearby and thought the sun had come up or something. So moths tend to be heavier bodied. They, a good chunk of them fly at night, but also a number of them are day flyers. So that's not a definitive thing, but their abdomens are usually, abdomens are usually uh, chunkier than uh, the slim bodies of the, uh, butterflies. And they mostly fly at night, but some actually will fly, um, yeah, more, they kind of fly all, all over the place. Like this white line sphinx, it's a real common sphinx moth, uh, nectaring on, I can't remember the blue flower in my garden, uh, the little proboscis is here, getting a treat, getting some food. And they need, butterflies and moths need all that nectar because they're beating their wings all the time to fly. They need a lot of energy. So this is a uh, uh, this is strictly a day flying moth. 
This is called snowberry clearwing moth. And when I was a little kid and I was collecting butterflies, I saw this bumblebee in the garden. I thought, ooh, I got a hole in my net. I'm gonna be brave and collect this bumblebee. Well, it wasn't a bumblebee. <laughs> it was this guy, the snowberry clearwing moth, because they're definitely a mimic of, of bees or bumblebees. Uh, and they feed, this one's feeding on swamp milkweed. And despite the name, it grows in gardens very nicely. It's probably one in the Midwest here, Kansas City, probably about the best uh, monarch food caterpillar you can plant, food plant you can plant and for flowers. So this one, even if you don't know names of things, or, or you get frustrated, you still have a chance to look and be interested in uh, what you're looking and observing. So like if you were to get close just to watch this guy um, feed, this is a proboscis here going down into the milkweed. But notice also that its little leg there is extended out straight and that's giving the moth the exact distance it, to the uh, flower. So, cause it's just fluttering, 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 fluttering. So that keeps it on, on, on track there. So just observing stuff like that, you know, uh, that that's the that's the enjoyable part, not just giving it all a name because you know naming things. It's, it's, some of you probably were late to it. It's, it's hard. It's uh, you either want to do it or you don't. So again, as far as looking at butterfly and moth, differentiating them, actually the best way is looking at their antennae. Butterflies have a filament, and then they have a little knob on the end. <clears throat> and we have, there's a group of butterflies called skippers. And they have little curved knobs. So you think, oh, that's pretty little to try to look at, but that's the way it is. Whereas moths have a wide variety of antenna types. This is a male polyphemus moth and big feathery ante antenna because those are what he uses to sense the pheromones the female release releases into the atmosphere for him to go track down a, fe a female to mate with. This one's a moth this little chickweed geometer, and you see it's on a filament, but it doesn't have it. Uh, I, keep, I keep using the wrong slide to point to, but anyway, hold it, where am I? Here I am. Okay, so you got this long slender filament, but nothing on the end. You don't have a knob like a butterfly does, even though this kind of looks like a butterfly, it's pretty. And then some moths, when they're at rest, they hide their antennae. So you have no idea what their antennae are. But that's big and furry, and that's pretty much so you're going to know that's a moth. Okay. So what about how they perch? Like if I'm just out walking and I see something in the distance, can I tell that a butterfly or moth? Well, some butterflies will uh, hold their wings above their body when they're nectaring. Sometimes these big ones have to flap their wings the whole time because they're so heavy. And some butterflies. Uh, don't hold their wings above their body like the morning cloak and they'll hold them uh, straight out probably to help get warmth but it's also fun for, for photographing but many moths also um, hold their wings over their body like the this gorgeous eight spotted forester and the uh, alanthus moth that we like to call the uh, hawaii shirt hawaiian shirt moth and then other moths like this, this is a, a green uh, emerald. It's a wavy line, uh, hold it, wavy line geometer. It's in the, the measuring caterpillar group geometer. And this is a moth and it always it sits here like this, nice stretched out. I guess it really likes its, take, its picture taken. But if, if you can think of it, you can say, that's beautiful. That should be a butterfly, but it's not, it's a moth. And this is a polyphemus moth. This is a male. And uh, this EO moth or IO moth, I've never remembered which way you pronounce it, but it's spelled I O. And they both have big uh, eye spots under here. So when their wings are folded, it's probably because they can just flick their upper wings out and kind of scare a, pre a potential predator away because they see those eyes and go, woo, there's big eyes. There must be something behind those big eyes. But these are uh, gorgeous. And they, they, this is how they rest, that or with their wings shut like that. And this one, I was out walking one day when I was early on trying to get pictures for the book or, or even thinking about doing a book. And I saw this guy and I thought, oh my gosh, that is the weirdest looking skipper. If you're familiar with butterflies, there's a group called skippers, which are difficult to identify. He says, I've never seen a skipper look like that. So I finally got a picture of it. 
But then when I got home and did it on, oops, whoops, ah, here, hold on. Previous, there we go. Um, got it enlarged on the computer screen. Turns out these antenna are feathery. And I thought, oh darn, it's a moth. I did get more on it actually. The caterpillar feeds on broomweed, uh, which kind of goes along the trails at the park where I was at. And then there's moths that uh, have very strange how they hold their wings. These are called plume moths, but as a youngster, I would call these the T-square moths because they're like a T-square. Although I guess a lot of kids don't even know what T-squares are today because everything's on the computer, all your uh, stuff. Um, but again, I made an observation. It's a shape. Oh, it's a T. It looks like T-square. So when I see another one, okay, that's one of those T-square moths. Uh, I'm not going to go see another one and go, well, maybe it's this one. Uh, but you know, you just start seeing characteristics that you can do uh, use to help you differentiate moths and butterflies in each one. So both butterflies and moths have four life stages. It all starts, the two boys and girls have to get together somehow and mate and lay eggs. This is a dainty sulfur. When you see a butterfly kind of going from plant to plant, not, not on the flowers, but on the leaves, just kind of plant to plant and checking things out. It's probably a female checking out, uh, like using her feet to check the chemical makeup of the leaf to see if it's the right leaf. And if you get closer, you might see her with her tail twisted down like this when she's ovipositing, that is egg laying an egg. This is on this little weedy plant called carpet weed. So then the little babes are there and they eventually hatch out. This happens to be the pipevine swallowtail. Hatch out into little guys, which then eat, 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 eat. It's one thing I always think, if you wanna be reincarnated, being reincarnated as a caterpillar, because all you do is eat, 24 seven you eat. <laughs> so their exoskeleton, the outside skin, allows them to grow so much. And then uh, hormones, do, yeah, hormones are released that cause this, that skin to split and out comes the next stage of the, the caterpillar and its skin will, our exoskeleton will go so much. And generally that takes about four times. And then you get these beautiful resting stage and butterflies, like I think I already said, butterflies, chrysalises, these are usually called, this is a chrysalis. Uh, it's also a pupa. And normally the term chrysalis just applies to butterflies and a moth is just a larva, but people get it interchanged and it's really not the end of the world. So, but a lot of fascinating shapes and colors and, uh, and I have a cat that wants down. <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> uh, so there's uh, different ones. This is one uh, pupating inside the leaf that it lived that ate. And then as it grows in that skin, eventually when it's getting ready to emerge, you'll start seeing the color of the wings come showing up. And then eventually the, body, the chrysalis splits and the adult crawls out. And this is a, and butterfly or moths, there are, there are moths that grow, make cocoons, but a cocoon, this is where some people do think that, that they would call this a cocoon, but really technically it's not. But the moth, um, has a silk lens at the mouth of the um, caterpillar. And it uh, weaves this cocoon with all that silk. That's uh, the silkworm moth in, uh, where is that, China, I guess, Asia somewhere that we get silk from. This is what they're getting it from is the cocoons. And then inside, once that's made inside the butterfly pupates. So if you were to look inside, this is a, called an atlas moth is at a butterfly festival. So there's the cocoon, but the pupa is right, right in the middle. So that's what you'd see. And then a lot of moths just pupate. They don't make a cocoon. Okay, so butterflies, I mean, the amazing metamorphosis, to think you're going from this little strange looking worm like critters uh, to these beautiful butterflies is how that's done is just, it just you, you can't not be amazed by it or enthralled by it. This is a series of pictures taken by my friend, Linda Williams. So this is the monarch caterpillar and they happen to form a J. This is the head, a J. And they have a little place here. And what's happening there is 
first the caterpillar with those little um, silk glands on either side of the mouth, lay down some sticky silk here. And it turns around and the, the tip of the abdomen has a little hooks on it and it grabs onto that and sort of solidifies itself on that spot. So it can hang from there. So then it starts splitting. So this is the, the last shell. This is gonna be the chrysalis. The skin start coming off or the exoskeleton and they keep what they wiggle a lot at this stage. There's more skin, more skin. And now the skin's all gone. They're, they still need to shrink up and before they are in the final looking one. So they get there eventually and form what we know of as the, butter, as the chrysalis. And the chrysalis is, you can actually see, I can hear, you can see the body shapes in there. Like that's where the wing's gonna be. You'll be able to see antenna. <clears throat> a lot of times you can see genitalia. So then we have, the, in this case, the beautiful monarch, and they have these gold spots on their uh, chrysalis, which have confused people for a long time. They didn't really know what they were. They're not gold. It's just how light is reflected. But they apparently are the um, spiracles, or the little holes that oxygen comes in, because they're still living, even while they're changing their body shape, and carbon dioxide, or carbon dioxide comes back out. And then eventually, this, the chrysalis completely clears up. You see the adult there and they come out and they, they usually hang on to their chrysalis or the stick. This is a really dangerous time because they're all wrinkled up and they start pumping fluid into all their veins. All these are veins that get the fluid pumped into it. It's a dangerous time because they can't fly. So for predators finding uh, butterflies or moths just emerging, it's a good time for good breakfast. But anyway, so this can take maybe an hour, a couple hours, depends on the species of a butterfly. And this, this you can look up Richard Stringer to learn more about it, because I found it fairly confusing, other than the fact that the pictures are incredible. So this is a CAT scan of a day-old monarch. So it's not just a case of building that, that last skin, the chrysalis, but they're actually already metamorphing into the adult. And I've read where all this body parts here, but it just confuses me. This is a nine-year-old chrysalis of the monarch. This is, a, I'm assuming that's the wing. So it's, a, yeah, you can kind of see this. This is where the gold spots are. Anyway, you can go on his website and get more information on it. Oh, I'm, I'm pointing to the wrong screen. Anyway, it's really, it, it's more complicated than I can figure out, but these are CAT scans. It's phenomenal what has been learned about metamorphosis. Now, butterflies uh, have two life stages, oh, well, two active life stages. They have the caterpillar and they have the adult butterfly, which is what happens that the immature stage uh, has an entirely different diet than the adult stage. Now, this happens to be a moth caterpillar, but it's a slide I had. It's a, uh, a white line sphinx moth caterpillar. Little uh, caterpillars have antenna. You probably can't see it, but there, there's an antenna there and, and here. And they also have these three little eyes. They aren't eyes that can focus on anything. They're mostly there to uh, uh, note motion, maybe dark and light. Because, you know, a caterpillar is not going to go anywhere in a hurry. So if some bird's coming down for it, it's not like it's going to go, it's going to run. So they have other ways to try to anticipate that. And here is one of the spher spiracles. Now, again, that's the breathing hole uh, for bringing oxygen in and carbon dioxide out, just like us humans. And another thing that even if you don't know, again, if you don't know it, just observe. So this is a black swallowtail caterpillar. And I just, I just laugh every time I watch this video. It's a hungry caterpillar. <laughs> it's uh, eating fennel. Look at it, it's just chop, 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 chop. And it's just delightful. I mean, you watch it six little feet and chomping away, finding another one to bite on. And if you think, well, if I had a really good camera, I could do that too. Well, this I took with my cell phone. And I just placed it on the table so it didn't shake and took a picture of this. So your, your uh, cell, cam cell phones, the newer ones are phenomenal. Okay. Oops. Oh, Got to get out of there. 
Okay, go away. Here we go. Okay. So the adults are feed differently. They actually have what's called a proboscis, which is under the head. It's stored under the head. It's actually two tubes. And it's stored under there till they get to finding something they like. And this is a tawny emperor butterfly. And this one has found some delicious honey water bait I put out in the summer. I squirt, spray it on redbud leaves because redbuds have nice big leaves. So they nice, nice flat surface for bugs they hold on to and the photographer to see. And of course, smaller butterflies tend to have smaller proboscis and they tend to be feeding on smaller flowers. And then, but the big guys like the Eastern tiger swallowtail here, it's working its uh, proboscis into this flower, but it's holding on really tight. So it's basically the right distance for the, uh, oh, here I get on the wrong thing, uh, proboscis there. It's holding on to those areas so they, they don't, so they can guide the proboscis down there. There's that. So, and then this was a picture. And, and, and when you take pictures, you know, you can get some pretty unusual pictures that you didn't think you got. So this is a little skipper. You can tell by the uh, curved antenna tip there. So I don't know if it's putting the uh, proboscis out or if it's curling it up back under its chin, but uh, I, I thought it was pretty cool. And again, uh, when you're learning, things can be pretty exciting. Like this was, um, Buckeye butterfly, and this is ladies, one of the ladies' dresses that grows in my prairie. And it says, the books say it's pollinated by insects. I have never seen an insect on ladies' dresses. And then one day, I actually saw this buckeye, and it is nectaring on the flower of the ladies' dresses orchid. I never saw it again, and I've never seen any other bugs on ladies' dresses, but, uh, but at least it was cool because I saw that and I was like, wow, that seems unusual. So at least I got it documented, so it's fun. So learning to identify butterflies, there's really no singular best way. Uh, you, know, you need to look, be concerned about what time of year you're looking. Obviously, January is not a good time around here. Um, some species have only one brood a year, so you only find them when you find them. Some have two to three plus broods per year. You can be looking at their, the shape of the wings, the outer edges of the wings, because they have distinct shapes, like angle wings have angly wings, grass skippers, that's how they, their wings fold, swallowtails with their tails. And wing color is, is, is good, but butterflies are often made up of multiple different colors, so it has its limits. So in the Kansas City area, we have um, three, four, yeah, six, six families of butterflies. The nymphalids, the lysinids, gossamer wings, these are the little blue guys, papillionidae, the swallowtails, purity, the whites and sulfurs, skippers, and metal marks. Metal marks are, it looks like they're starting to make a, have, making inroads and making populations here in the Kansas City area, which is quite exciting because they haven't been here. Maybe it's, maybe it's global or climate change or they're just, they got tired of where they lived, but you just learn on your own. So when to start looking? Well, you can start looking pretty early because this is a Henry's elephant. It's one, this is Henry's elephant. It's one of the first butterflies out and its emergence is timed with the red bud flowers blooming and wild plum uh, blooming because that's what the adult nectar's on and then they lay their eggs on those flowers and then the little guy, little, caterpillars feed and then they pupate and that's where they hang out till the next season. So if you didn't see it early, you're not gonna see it later until the next year. And some of the ones that, at, that overwinter as adults, we have like the goatweed leaf wing. Leaf wings are, look like a leaf on the side. Some of the tropical ones are incredible. This is the morning cloak that um, overwinters as an adult. This one, this one holds a special place in my mine because as a child when I was starting to collect butterflies um, I had never seen one live and suddenly I found one I was just beyond excited because it's like whoa so every time I see a, a cloak morning cloak I have that remembrance which is fun to remember those fun things of childhood and the other couple of the other groups are the groups represented that overwinter I call them the grammatical uh, butterflies 
So we have this column are the question marks, this column are the column, commas. And they get their name because they got this little tiny white or silvery kind of mark on the underwing. This one is has looks like a question mark. And on the comma, it kind of looks like a comma. Sometimes you can't see that and you have to depend on other traits, but that's how they're named. Um, they overwinter. And so when you see, when they first come out in the spring, this is what they look like, although sometimes they're rather beat up. But this is also what they look like in the fall because it's the last brood that comes out, that emerges that overwinters. And you know the summer brood because the summer brood, for some reason, I don't think anybody knows, they have dark hind wings on the question mark and on the uh, comma. So again, things to observe, it's different. Oh, and down here was the gray comma. It's not as common as these guys, depending on where you live, but it has striations on it, which is a dead giveaway when it's uh, there cuddling or something. So I do kind of gear, gear this a little bit toward my book. Uh, I've had, I have, um, uh, it covers 100 species in detail, and then another 30 that are outside our region, but are really cool looking butterflies. And not all those 100 you're gonna find every year. <laughs> so uh, when I said color wasn't the greatest, but this is what we have. So I'm gonna go by orangish, orange brownish, because you know, we all see things differently, especially on color. You might think that looks like bright orange. And I'm going, no, it's more like orange brownish. But anyway, try to get that. You can kind of relate it to what I'm talking about. And the first one, the, the most notorious one is the monarch, which is so well known and it's amazing migration every fall to Mexico. It, is a, it can be a common garden visitor. Caterpillars only feed on plants in the milkweed family. So if you're building uh, milk or building gardens for butterflies, you obviously want the nectar sources, but you also need what the kids eat. In this case, you need uh, milkweed plants. And around here, uh, like I said, the swamp milkweed is really good. The uh, butterfly milkweed is also good, but it takes a few years to get it established. But once it's established, I got one patch of those that my mom planted, I don't know, probably 30, 40 years ago, and it's still growing. <laughs> So they are tough. But anyway, they, 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 um, it's fascinating. Nobody really knows why they have this lifestyle of coming north in the summer and south in the winter because they're not going to the beaches to hang out. They're actually going up to the mountains where it's cold. And in the spring, which is now, so by next week, literally, they, have, they will start leaving their roofs and heading north. So this no, the roost area down here, oh, the roost area down here, and they will start hitting back north. Texas, which you can hardly see with all this color, but Texas is an extremely important place for monarch survival because they start mating after they get going and then they got lay their eggs someplace. So they lay them in, on milkweeds in, in uh, Texas. So this area is really important for the survival of monarchs. So generally what you see up here are the offspring of the butterflies that overwintered. But every once in a while, you might get, might get one that comes all the way back and um, you go, whoa, pretty cool. Okay. Oh, and there's also the milkweed plants. Apparently there's different species and some of them are kind of timed for when the monarchs come through. The fall migration, you know, probably day length, temperature changes, various other things that triggers them to head south. But the last broods don't mate and they eventually get together and start moving south. And for some of them, that's 2000 miles to get to Mexico. And then there's a bunch over on the West Coast for some reason, and they don't migrate anywhere except kind of back and forth there. And they don't migrate to Mexico. So not sure what they learned. But the monarch is the only butterfly to make such a long two-way migration every year. Um, but it's interesting because they only make the trip once. It's not like they go, oh yeah, I remember that, that patch of uh, evergreen trees. Oh, over there, oh, there's that Target store we flew by last year. They, most of them don't come back. So it's just innate in their bodies on how they get here. 
But we can, we can see broods of, or bunches of monarchs here because they do have to rest. They don't fly the whole way. They do have to rest. This was a roost. I got there a little late. Most of them had flown out, but a little roost down in Gardner, Kansas that had been up in this maple tree for a couple days. And this one, Linda Williams took some years back. This is in Liberty, Missouri. I mean, this kind of congregation of monarchs is like what you see at the monarch roosting sites, just thick with monarchs. So that was really exciting that you could get that shot. So they all head to Mexico. And one of the ways that uh, it's been learned about uh, how, where they go it, is this tagging system. Their, their wings are tough. They don't they have to be tough to fly that far. So this little wing, this little patch doesn't hurt them, doesn't affect flight, has a number on it. So anybody can do this, citizen scientists. You order the little stickers from Monarch Watch in Lawrence and in the fall, late summer, you can collect them, put, the, put that on. You have to write in a diary as her, the male, female, and the number, date, what are the weather conditions. And then when you get done, you mail that back to Monarch Watch. And so this tagging program actually goes back to 1940. And people were wondering where in the heck did these butterflies go? Nobody knew. So this Fred Urquhart out of Toronto, he wound up creating this network of 3000 butterfly enthusiasts to tag monarchs. And, but they were only able to get to Texas. They never knew where they went after that. So it sort of stayed like that. Well then, uh, American businessman down in Mexico had had read uh, Urquhart's article about this, and he says, "Hey, I was just out. We had this hailstorm, and all these monarchs fell out of the sky. And it's like, whoa, monarchs in Mexico. So that piqued Urquhart's uh, in the brain, and he said, "Well, hey, why don't you, if you got time, why don't you start go searching? And this is." He's, he, this is a fellow with no, not, no formal training in entomology, he was an extremely successful businessman, um, never went to college, but was very successful. Because you don't have to get a degree in entomology to enjoy and learn and become an expert in, in some area. It's, it's full open for that. But he and his wife spent two years searching for the monarchs. So this Kenneth Brueger um, was the one that was searching. And so January 2nd, 1975, they finally found him. And that was in the mountainous areas south of uh, Mexico City. They're in a certain uh, type of trees. But even though we talk about all those guys way south, remember that they do need our help. And even if you have sm just a small garden, planting some milkweeds for them to feed on, the caterpillars to feed on, is a good way of helping to strengthen the populations. So uh, this one, this one's on a purple milkweed. But uh, when monarchs eat the milkweed, they're actually poisonous or untasty. And the adults re keep that poison in their bodies to help protect them from being eaten. Because uh, you think they're you know, fair game when there's millions of, and there's tens of millions of them go there. So all a butterfly has to do is kind of nibble on it and it goes and doesn't bother anymore. But then the viceroy here, which is not related to the monarch whatsoever, looks like a monarch. And so it acquires some protection by looking like a monarch. So however evolutionary wise that happened, it happened. Uh, but this is often, you often see publications that are talking about monarchs and this is what they're showing, which is rather hilarious. And a way to remember monarchs is that they got this line on the hind wings so that in a V shape, so that's V for viceroy. Again, figuring out different ways to remember what you're seeing. These guys feed the caterpillars on willow and poplar trees, particularly, and willow trees for sure. And those are along creeks and other waterways, ponds. A, chance, a good chance of finding the caterpillars if you want to raise some caterpillars. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother story. So the other brown, orangish, brownish, brownish, orange group are the fritillaries. And they're in the group Nymphalidae, which is their little front two legs are held up here and they walk on four legs. They feed on plants in the violet family. But of interest is that they, um, in the case of, well, there's, we have this variegated fritillary. 
which is not as it's it's not that it's more common in prairies at least what my experience has been and then we have the great spangled fritillary which you you can get in suburbia anyway they feed on um violets well the ones in the prairie are feeding on prairie violets and you think about in the fall you have six eight foot tall grass where is that female going to find a spot to lay the egg <laughs> so i'll get to that in just a second so initially the, the male emerges first and he's light colored here. He emerges about a week before and then the female is more dark up here and they eventually find each other. The male lives out its life, eventually dies. And the female flies all summer with the eggs inside her and she's been mated, but the sperm is not, the uh, eggs aren't, aren't um, fertilized yet. They get fertilized as they leave the body. So, and they just scatter their eggs. Goodbye, good luck. And then the little caterpillars hatch out and try to find a violet plant. And then they stay in that very tiny, tiny first stage of a caterpillar uh, until next spring. And great spangle, of course, gets its name because of the gorgeous silver spangles on the back. There, it's just a gorgeous butterfly. Let's see. Oh, that was that. Okay, we also have another species that uh, only grows in high quality tall grass. I keep looking out my window, I need to look at that. It grows in um, high quality tall grass prairie. Uh, if we have any here where I live, which I have had one or two over the years, they're only here because they've accidentally got blown here during stormy weather or whatnot. They've never established a population. Uh, east of the Mississippi, they think this one is basically gone. But like here, Kansas, we have the huge Kanza Re Biological Research Station out by Manhattan. They have a, a great population of them. And then in Missouri, Missouri's full of those, I don't know what you call them, not quite pocket prairies, but it's full of a lot of little prairies that are protected by the state. And uh, those, uh, a lot of those do have uh, the regal fritillary and the state is actually trying to monitor it because it is a it is an at-risk butterfly okay then painted ladies the ladies we have two kinds painted and american ladies they have um and they can you get confused identifying them but because they kind of look alike when they're on flight but the uh painted lady has like four spots on its hind wing the female or the American lady only has two. So you think, okay, two is at the beginning of the numbers. Americans at the beginning of numbers, American lady. I mean, simple things like that to try to learn to uh, ID these things. They feed on thistles and um, I see them in the spring. They're, they're laying their eggs on pussy toes in my prairie. I have a three acre remnant tall grass prairie and they're laying their eggs on those, which I have a hard, I get very concerned because it, they're laying their eggs in my trail, but I, I still get plenty of them. So I guess it doesn't stop them. The other one I showed briefly earlier was the goatweed leaf wing. It's also an emphalic and the wings are very good uh, to hide like a leaf. This is a female in the fall, a male. They feed, the caterpillar feeds on a little plant but called goatweed because they feed on goatweed. And another name for goatweed is croton. And it's just a little plant, doesn't grow very tall. It's a very fragrant plant. It, you can crush the leaves. And so initially, oh, well, this is initially when they're just packed, just little things, they only, they only feed at the end of the, the end of the leaf. But boy, they, they clean it all off except for the uh, midrib there. And if you look close, you can see there's the little caterpillar that's been feeding there at the tip end. But then they grow and so, they they will pull the leaf around their body we call these like burritos so that this this around them and then they keep can eat safely from in there to avoid predators and this one i don't this is the leaf i don't know if it's trying to get back in or what i'm assuming it was getting ready to form a chrysalis but there's a big one that's probably real close to forming a chrysalis stage but the, this is a neat little plant to grow it just um most people probably pull it up because they think it's a weed because it really isn't very striking except the fragrance, but you get these beautiful goatweed butterflies. 
Now the yellow, orangish yellow, or yellowish orange. This is a big group. These are the sulfurs, and we have lots of those. Those are some of the most common butterflies you're gonna see in the summer. And these are the, what I call the medium-sized sulfurs. Well, maybe medium, I don't know. These here, um, we have two that look really like alike closely. The trouble with them is that they will hybridize. And so midsummer, you might not be able to tell which one it is. And so you just go orange and clouded sulfur, or you can tell otherwise if you get comfortable with that. Both the, both the uh, orange and clouded sulfur have, will have albino females, not all, all the time. And once they're in this, if they're an albino, you can't tell a species what they are unless you see the mating with the, the species, the male that you can identify. <clears throat> so let's see. Then we have the cloudless sulfur. This is a big, gorgeous yellow butterfly you see more peaking more toward the end of summer, midsummer to late summer, flying all high in the sky. And it's called cloudless because unlike these guys that have clouds on their wings, they have no clouds on their wings. So these guys are only summer residents. They, uh, they actually do migrate out of here. And the late summer, early fall, you can, if you're standing in one place, you can count, you, chances are you can count a lot of these flying by, but they don't go south to, to hang out in the trees they just go south where it's warmer. So they don't, they, they're not making a complete migratory route. They just go down and keep mating and laying eggs. And um, they have very long proboscis that's very specialized. They can really feed on the deep throated uh, plants. And a place you can often see, a, uh, the place you can often see a lot of butterflies, especially the sulfurs, is on mud or in the middle of a gravel road. And particularly the males uh, puddle, they think that they're actually getting some new night, uh, minerals from the bit. And in fact, for some avid photographers, they will go and put, they will go and release pee in several spaces and hopes of gathering some good gatherings of butterflies. And I remember one guy on one of my trips to uh, South America and he was going, Oh, he was lying flat on the ground going, oh, these are great. These are great. And then, then he kept smelling something. And he thought, oh, my gosh. And all the photographers had peed all over the place. <laughs> so, uh, and they're, so they're puddling. And I was, um, when I was working on the book, I was on a country road. It's a, it was a gravel, kind of gravelly road. And there was a big, big bunch of puddling butterflies, probably 100 of them, different, all different species. And in the middle of them, I spotted a butterfly. That's another, it comes up here as a stray called a marine, uh, marine blue, no, hold it. Yeah, marine blue. And I found it in the middle of this uh, flock of mostly sulfurs. And when I came back to photograph, I had to get on the ground. I'm like, oh God, here's this 40 <laughs> something <laughs> overweight woman lying flat on the ground in the country. Uh, thank God nobody came by. So, <laughs> so I got my pictures. What we do for what we do for our fun science. This is another gorgeous sulfur, the southern dog face, southern because it's a southern species. And some years we have them, some years we don't. I, I don't know if there's any rhyme or reason for that. They're named dog face because the upper the wings have this supposedly dog face on them. And these, if you're a photographer, if you've ever tried to take pictures of the upper wings. Uh, butterflies that never hold them out, like the sulfurs, their wings are always up, up over their body unless they're flying. And so you, you go out with a pocket full of swear words, because it's, it's usually summer, it's hot, miserable. And you get, you get your camera set up and just go click, 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 click. And hopefully on one of those clicks, the wings will be open and the rest you can throw away. This is a uh, this is a late summer. They get pink on them, but these are aren't, these are just striking butterflies. Oh my! This was along a late the lake one summer. Again, swamp milkweed here, uh, one of the late summer asters. That one flops down. So then we got some little sulfurs, and we got dainty, so, uh, dainty sulfur. This one over here. It's the smallest uh, butter yellow butterfly in North America. But this little sulfur here, oh crap, 
the little, so, oh, sorry. Um, little, see, I don't have an audience, so I'm not sure how I'm reacting. <laughs> little sulfurs and dainty sulfurs. And these are tiny little, little butterflies. This is a comparison of an orange sulfur with a little, little sulfur. And by the end, by, by midsummer of both of these, they are in every single county in Kansas. So these little guys are really making an effort <laughs> to push the envelope north to think that these little butterflies and the re, you know mating and laying eggs, repeating, repeating that, eventually are busy little butterflies in every county. And it's remarkable. And they also have summer and fall forms. This is summer, this is fall. They actually acquire a little darker on the underwing. So I just said that, okay. Sleepy orange, sleepy orange. Sleepy orange gets its name because on all the other ones, they have, a, they have a circle here that's open. So this one's closed, they called it sleepy orange. If you ever see a butterfly flying around and, and the first impression you have is bright orange, you're most likely looking at the, the sleepy orange because they are really bright on top. And so when they see them fly and, and see that bright orange, that's what they are. Well, of course they get together and they really like senna, wild senna and partridge pea. So you see the little curved abdomen. And sulfurs are neat because when sulfurs lay eggs, they, they lay them, the, the egg sticks up. I don't know how you tell them. the eggs is it's on the bottom of it. So like here, oh, on the bottom of here, straight up, uh, same as shown here. So again, it's only a summer resident, but it can be quite abundant or not. It just varies year to year. This is the caterpillar and it forms this chrysalis and eventually reproduces. There we go. Okay. So now we have the mostly white, orange and or black markings category. This is kind of a smaller one. These, these white butterflies here are actually in this, what we call the sulfur family, or maybe we call them the whites and sulfurs, uh, even though they're not yellow. Uh, the, their caterpillars all feed on plants in the mustard family. So these can be a common butterfly in a poor, poor soil conditions that allow a lot of weedy stuff because a lot of the, the uh, mustard grasses are, are weedy type grasses. And that's what the caterpillars feed on. This is the, I say that that's the female and male. And then we have the cabbage white. If you're a gardener, you'd probably growl at that photo. This, this is a caterpillar and if you grow broccoli and you are cleaning it up, trying to get the caterpillars out, the little green caterpillars, that's what they are, are these cabbage whites. And that's what you're getting. There's just extra protein. And some butterflies can actually resist mating. They, I don't know why this, I don't know why this female doesn't like this male, but he was flying around, flying around, trying to get her excited, I guess. But when she raised up her abdomen, it was a, no, get away. I'm not interested in you. <laughs> So he, he went on his way to find another one. But it is also our only alien butterfly in the United States, but it's extremely common. Uh, this is not too common in the Kansas City area. Uh, it's, people have found it in some of the parks or Powell Gardens and places like that. You go south just a little ways and that's when you find the falcate orange tip. And it's also in the mustard family and uh, they're, they're just a neat looking butterfly. Look at the, the male with the orange up there and the marbling under there. So I, in order to get my pictures, I went to Nob Noster State Park because uh, I found a lot there one spring day. And I just photograph. I don't, I don't collect. It's hard enough to edit, but pictures and maintain a collection. Now there's a small bluish or grayish. And these are the blues. And when I was little, they were just all called little blues. I don't know, maybe I just called them little blues. But we have the Eastern tail blue, really common. And they have these little tails on the hind wing and on both the upper side of the fat wing and on the underside of the wing, there's two little orange spots. Whereas we have another group called the spring and summer azures, which does not have a tail and does not have orange. Spring and summer azures, there's two, it's two different species. At one time they thought there was only one species of azure, azures. And apparently this point, I know they're up to at least five species, 
Fortunately for us, there's only two here in the Kansas City area, but you can't tell them apart except by time of flying. So if you find them in April, you're looking at spring. You're finding them end of May, you got summer azures. That's all you can go on. But they have the beautiful azure top of the male. Let's see, got that. Mm -hmm. And we said all that. So again, the, the upper wings are just gorgeous. And again, you're just kind of taking your look, getting taking pictures. I do use an electronic flash, uh, a, a double one, one from each side to do most of my bug photography. But here again, this is a female I, I spotted. She's actually feeding, she's actually laying eggs on the um, uh, rough leaf dogwood uh, flower buds because they will then proceed to eat those once those come out. And this is was dead. So, yeah. Again, observing actions is just what they're doing. And again, puddling is a great place to find them. Uh, this was a bunch of, I think it's Azure's and, yeah, it's Azure's and uh, Eastern Tail Blues here. This was along a pond, so who knows what was there. Then we have a group called Hair Streaks. And they, almost all of them have, let me see if I got this. We got, the gray hair streak, which is really common, really common around. He, he eats a lot of different food, a lot of different green plants. That's a caterpillar. And it's a commonest. And then if you're out in the prairie, you're going, you probably are going to see banded hair streak. And you can really see the hair streak on that well. Uh, and this is our only green hair streak, the juniper hair streak. And it feeds on, the caterpillar feeds on cedar which is fun. So those are some examples there. And then another one that's kind of unusual is the red banded hair streak. Here you can really see the tails, but the red banded, the larva or caterpillar feed on dead leaves, which seems quite remarkable, but I guess they get enough, you get enough food from it that they turn into a gorgeous little butterfly. Now, another group in that are called the coppers, and they get named the coppers because a number of them have kind of a coppery color. And these were exciting to find. I, I, it took me, it was really hard for the book to find coppers. They aren't that abundant around here, and you just got to be in the right place at the right time. And this was near a waterway. This is one of the, uh, the uh, smart weeds that grows real tall. So, this is a bronze copper, which just, I think, is just stunning. Um, yeah, and we also have the gray copper, and you'll find those, they'll actually come out in the prairie and nectar. So then we have the large colorful with tails on hind wings, and you probably guess those are the swallowtails. First one I'll show is the tiger swallowtail. That's the caterpillar. A lot of caterpillars look like poop, because apparently poop's not too tasty. So this is a yellow one. But this is also a yellow, this is also an Eastern tail uh, tiger, but it's black or darkish color, but you can still see the, the tiger stripes on it. And we're, and this is the top of the dark form, but in areas where these butterflies overlap with the pipevine swallowtail, which I'll show shortly, it's a type of mimicry. So uh, areas like this will have both dark form and yellow forms because we do have, there are quite a few populations of pipe vine swallowtails in the Kansas City area, even though there's not that much natural pipe vine here, but lots of people have planted lots of pipe vine. So again, it, it, you know, how do, how do they know that? How do they know to not come out yellow, but to come out this color? It's, it's, oh, it's, just, it's just this color, it just blows your brain. And again, just taking time, um, it's really fun. I, I couldn't get the, video to load, but taking pictures of butterflies in flight with your cell phone, it's great. This one's is it in flight uh, and shoot them in slow motion. And you can just get some wonderful, wonderful shots. This is a gorgeous, again, tiger swallowtail. And here, this is, it's either landing or taking off. I'm not sure which. It was a hot day. I was out there snapping pictures and hoping something would come out. And this one did us. I just thought it was a really awesome picture. And that's, it's been nectaring on one of the mountain mints. Oops. Okay, black swallowtail is one that's fun because they're real easy to raise. 
and they feed on plants in the plants in the parsley family. So if you've got parsley, that's what the little worms are uh, on it right here. Not worms, but caterpillars. Uh, and those are not monarch caterpillars. Caterpillars know what they're feeding on. Don't move those to milkweed. And they're very easy to raise. They, they, they grow pretty quick. And so if you got kids or you just wanna do it for the fun of it, you can bring them in and <clears throat> feed them food, the parsley. You wanna be careful about parsley from the store because it may have some pesticide on it. Uh, but, uh, or you grow fennel and, and um, grow, you grow your own parsley. It's easy to grow fennel and um, the, what's the other one? Mm. What are you putting dill weed? Can't remember. Can't remember now. Okay. So again, this is the one we had the I had the little video of it chomping on the fennel. And there when you if you are doing photography, it really is fun because you can you know, start getting up close and caterpillars pretty much they hold still. So this is uh, the eggs on the fennel plant. Here's a couple nearly full grown. And just even just photographing parts of it. So these are its little toes uh, surrounding the stem. And I just, it's just, a, it's just, what is it? But it is, it's a, the butterfly or the moth, yeah, the butterfly legs, just adorable. Swallowtail butterflies attach their tail end like this. They don't do it like the J shape, like the monarchs. And they have a little uh, girdle or a couple pieces of um, silk that hold them on. And they, that's how they make their chrysalis. And again, just being able to see the different sides of things. This is a close to the front. You can see the, the three little um, uh, eggs, eggs, not eggs, eyes. And so they're fun, to, they're fun to raise and they're easy to raise. They're real easy. Pipe vine swallowtails, these are gorgeous. Again, not, they're not gonna see them just any place in the metro area, but people that have been growing pipe vine for a long time have a lot of these. And this is the incredible caterpillar. <laughs> talk about scary looking. Pipe vine swallowtails do um, acquire poison from their food plant. And as a result, uh, birds won't eat them. And that's where this idea of the mimicry of uh, like the black swallowtails and the tiger swallowtails dark, that this belief that they're somehow mimicking the pipe vine. And then what's considered the largest butterfly in North America is the giant swallowtail. And it is a common visitor to the plant, to your gardens. You can plant rue, which is just a herb you buy in the, at the uh, uh, net nursery. I don't know what you do with it. I raise caterpillars on it. It's for something. Or it's actually feeds on plants in the citrus family, except for that. And we do have, a plant in the citrus family, and that's prickly ash, which is a native, native little shrub here. And that's where I find all the, the caterpillars every year. And these are just, you know, they're huge and just gorgeous. If you live in Southern United States, you don't like them because the larvae are called orange dogs and they feed on citrus. Mm, so they're, they can be a menace in a, a citrus forest, citrus garden. And again, this one, this is the, um, close-ups of the giant swallowtail. This one's nectaring on mountain mint. But look how the legs are just like, they're just the right length to keep them uh, from totally smooshing their proboscis into this little teeny tiny flower. And this is another one that shows it e uh, even better, that proboscis going in there, but it's not gonna get suddenly squished in there and broken. My favorite swallowtail is a zebra, black and, yet black and white. These are found in woodlands, especially along creeks, because the only food plant for the caterpillar is pawpaw. And uh, if you don't have pawpaws, you're not going to have zebra swallowtails. Places like the Overland Park Arboretum, they're loaded with pawpaw trees, and they get a lot of they get a lot of these beautiful zebra swallowtails. And the summer brood, then, uh, this is feeding on some butterfly milkweed, have longer tails than the spring, the spring brood do. Don't know why, but they do. Then for the last group, medium to large, brown to very dark with blue or yellow or red orange markings. So uh, we visited the morning cloak uh, already a few times. Again, it does not feed on um, flowers. It might occasionally, but it feeds on uh, rotten fruit and tree sap and 
dung and young and carry it. Yum, 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 yum. So this one, um, I put out rotten fruit in the summer to attract all sorts of things. I attract a lot of flies, which is obnoxious, but then I get really cool other bugs. This is the larva of the morning cloak. Look at that spiky looking devil. And it's totally harmless. Another a butterfly that's a little more associated with woodlands is the red spotted purple, named for the little purple spots underneath. And this beautiful iridescent blue. But if you were to go north, you might find this butterfly. And uh, believe it or not, this is the same butterfly as this. But for whatever reason, the populations of red spotted purples were separated, probably just from ge the geology or the area. And so in here, south here, they all turned they all turned into these but north for some reason you know evolutionary wise how the genes do their thing but these can mate with these and produce viable offspring so it's still still the same species so that's pretty cool and here is my rotten fruit so you can get a lot of good opportunities i sit and take these pictures i got all ways to sit to rest i can't walk real well so uh you can see it's proboscis eating something tasty there. This is cantaloupe. They really like rotten cantaloupe. So that's a fun way to get more pictures of butterflies and other bugs. And when I was a little kid, I had a little garden area in my the yard, and these guys would come and light on me. I just thought, oh, they're lighting on me because they think I'm special, that I like butterflies. Later on, I found out they just like my sweat. <laughs> so, but they still they still hold a place in my myself the red admiral but you can this one does like sweat so like if if you're out in the you see them you know you're sweaty I'll, I'll just like get some sweat off my head on my fingers which is what i did here and just carefully put your finger under their feet really slowly and see if they'll walk on you and if you've got some good salt salty um sweat they'll be there so that, that's fun fun uh, to do things like that the buckeye, another very common butterfly, but it's only here in the summer. And they now got these cool buckeyes. The late season ones have a pinkish underwing and they also get dark for some reason. Again, maybe to stay warm as it gets cooler, but they all die off, but they're beautiful and they're all over the place in the summer. Oh, pink, yeah. And these are some caterpillars of them that are feeding on mullen foxglove, uh, I never remember. It's got a horrible, na horrible name. And it's Mullen Foxglove. It's not a Mullen. It's not a Foxglove, but it's got stuck with that common name. Uh, but I found these on that out in my prairie a couple of years ago, a lot of them. But they'll also grow on toad flax. They'll grow on your snapdragons. Uh, so you can, and plantain, plantain, Ruelius. So uh, there's lots of ways you can encourage them to be in your yard. Betsy, this is Carol. I'm so sorry to, to cut in, but it's uh, 524 and we're going to have to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, it's such wonderful inf information. Oh, my God. I um, didn't realize that. I thought I was going pretty fast. Um, <laughs> but if, if we could just um, st st pause here and so we have time to take a few questions, perhaps okay. we could we could have you back on to cover the rest of what you didn't have time for. And I'm sure people <laughs> would have lots of questions there, too. But yeah, um, I, do, I do. I do. Provide, I do present a lot of information, but but sure. Yeah, because there's. Yeah, no, I had no idea. <laughs> it's OK. Um, so um, I was just enjoying talking. <laughs> I know. Well, it's wonderful. The photos are wonderful and everyone's really enjoying it. But we'd like to try to get to a few questions um, yeah. before we need to, um, to head up. And, and also for everybody uh, still on, uh, Betsy will be back in a few weeks with an introduction to beetles as well, which will be wonderful. I'll have to work on that slide. She'll make it make sure it's fits in your time. <laughs> well, with this, with your butterfly, you had a lot of great introductory information about taxonomy of insects. So that's kind of for those who come back on that they will have already had that primer, which is great. Um, just try to get to a few questions here. Um, <laughs> oh, I love that a photo of uh, Iris there. <laughs> anybody anybody chasing uh insects you know that people look at you really funny <laughs> <laughs> that's okay to live that life other, others don't understand it's yes that's right um 
Tracy asks, is it the salt in the sweat that they like? What is it about the sweat? Well, they, the salt. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, they're, they're feeding on the salt. They may be some other stuff in there, but I think it's primarily the salt. So there's a camera. Um, there's a question about plants that the, um, would attract the regal fritillary on prairies. And of course, that's just a few species of prairie violets on our prairies. And you mentioned yeah. Uh, that about how our remnant prairies are so important for the regals and oh, very, uh, yeah. the Missouri Prairie Foundation owns and manages 30 uh, properties and Ooh. many of those um, have uh, regals and we, we are also collecting violet seeds and raising uh, violet plants to increase the wow. populations of the violets which is pretty difficult. Yeah work. they they are they are a strange plant. And uh, we also have lots of butterfly information on our website. And um, Betsy mentioned her friend, Linda Williams. And Linda created a wonderful uh, table of host plants and the butterflies that uh, use those host plants. And Brooke will be able to send a link to that tomorrow as well. Um, and before we do get, we'll try to get to just a, a few more questions here. I'm going to have to sign off at 5.30, but Brooke can take just a, a few others. But Is anybody you, still out there? <laughs> uh, yeah, we still have 251 folks on. So Woo, okay. um, why don't you just, can you just mention real quick about your book and how people could um, order it? And then maybe yeah. we can get to just a few more questions. Yeah, my book, which it is not to be ego driven or anything. It is the most comprehensive book for butterflies in the Kansas City region. Um, uh, my account on Amazon got shut off this last summer. I was in the hospital for an extended period of time and I, could, I wasn't answering emails. So I've had to reconstitute it, which I did last night or started to, but I'm not sure. I just checked it and you still can't buy it from me. So just keep coming back to Amazon and hopefully I'll get it. You can buy it. There are other people have the books, used books for sale. One's for $54. <laughs> but then um, you can also, I, uh, yeah, that's the best way it'll be to watch on Amazon. Cause I watch on Amazon cause I will, um, I will eventually get that taken care of. Okay, great. And then there's, there's just some, a, a couple of references on, the, on, the, on the internet. This one is real interesting. I don't talk about it in the presentation, but it's about the causes of color in butterflies, uh, which is quite fascinating. So that might be a, a website you want to visit and learn more about color. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask a question and then I'm gonna uh, sign off and then Brooke, <laughs> but Brooke will be able to take just a few more questions. So okay. Matt asks, are there predators that eat or destroy chrysalises? I found some monarch ones in my yard last year that were damaged with the dead caterpillar still in it? Should they be placed in protective areas or left where they are found originally? Oh, you just leave them where you found them because chances are there, there's a, what gets a lot of caterpillars are parasitic wasps. That, that's in the group called Ign Ign Ignumens and Burconids. And uh, you can sadly watch them. There's also flies, the tachinid, there's flies like a tachinid fly. And, when you see all that strange yucky stuff coming from the chrysalis that, and then a little hole where the fly came out of. If you're interested in raising caterpillars into adults, the best thing is to get them with, at the egg stage. Even at that, there could be a parasite inside it, but the whole world of parasites is incredible. Uh, so yeah you, can, yeah, you can find a lot of them have been turned into flies or wasps. But to move them anything, no, no. There's also stink worms really like the caterpillars or not stink worms, stink bugs. So yeah, no, eat. they're at the bottom of the food chain. So everybody wants to, eat, wants to eat at the bottom of the food chain. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Well, this, this is Brooke now. I'm taking over some of the questions. Okay. Um, I, a lot of what's here in the comments is praises and a lot of praise for your book from people who already have it. Um, oh, good, so, good. so that's exciting. Um, here's a, here's a good question. Since you observe your backyard butterflies all the time, um, Dr. Barnhart asked, have you noticed any changes in distribution or timing of butterflies over the years? 
Uh, yeah, we didn't quite get to those in the slideshow, but yeah, I, I now have populations of uh, the Jim Satter, and those are there's quite a few populations of those in the Kansas City area now. So that's that's a that's a new new populations of those butterflies have come up here and apparently have settled in. And then uh, let's see. Last summer, I get confused because my life got disrupted there. Let's see, 2020. I think it was 2019, 2020. Mm. No, 20, 2019, sorry. Um, I actually found, I spotted a metal mark in my garden, in my prairie, and they've never been seen in Kansas. It was the first record of a metal mark and it was in pristine condition, which tells me there was a, some parents someplace. <laughs> and so I, I didn't see any more that summer and I wasn't out last summer. And so there is a possibility, there, there are some other uh, known populations of them, but nobody, we, nobody tells anybody where they are because uh, they're real precious and we don't want people to go in and wipe them all out collecting them. So, um, but this Northern metal mark, yeah, it was pretty, it was very exciting because I not only, I got from the prairie because I was on a scooter, got into my house, got my good camera, came back out and it was still there. <laughs> I guess it wanted its better, its picture taken. So yeah, those two for sure, uh, as far as uh, range expansion. And I don't know about the others. I think it's kind of the, uh, I wouldn't say I've seen a lot of major differences. Well, I'll have to admit, I've actually moved on to uh, bugs, a lot of other bugs, because I, I blacklight a lot. So <laughs> that keeps me occupied. That's awesome. Blacklighting is a lot of fun. Um, speaking of, you were talking about photographing those um, butterflies, and of course, many of these images from you this whole time. Uh, there are a couple questions asking about tips on photographing them, on how we, to get them to stay still, or is it just a, a practice in <laughs> patience? Well, I call it a sport <laughs> and you learn how to stalk. And when I first tried to but do butterflies in the early summer, I, I have to get my stalking technique back together. So as far as going slow, you know, being very slow on how you get your camera up. Um, some people say don't shadow them from the sun because they'll flip. I've never, I've never had that problem because what they're looking for is, is sharp, is quick movement. So yeah, they uh, sometimes you have to chase them quite a bit. <laughs> like those, that one cloudless sulfur, I chased through my prairie. I got a couple great shots and then boy, it was gone. Who knows where it went? But yeah, stalking and uh, so a lot of the butterflies will come to the fruit bait. And when they're there, they're just there. They're just hanging out. So you got great opportunities for photography there. Uh, but it is, it is a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of field work. And getting your camera, I mean, cell phones do a remarkable job. It's just, you have to be pretty close to the butterfly. So I, ha I use two, uh, two, I have a digital SLR and um, two flashes that I can move around to light, light the bugs. So I get, so that's how I can stop motion sort of with the uh, butterflies in flight. But yeah, it's a, just look at it as a sport. You know, I, you know, I broke my leg one time doing it. Um, <laughs> So lots of oh, ticks. wow, it is lots, an extreme sport, lot, it sounds lots like. Lots of ticks, lots of falling down. Because when you're mm -hmm. photographing, you're not really paying attention to a lot. You're just mm -hmm. focused on that bug you want to photograph. And then, geez. oh, I dislocated uh, yeah, the clavicle breastbone one time. So yeah, it's kind of a sport. <laughs> sounds like it, sounds like it. Um, here's someone's asking, uh, what type of mosquito spraying is best for butterflies? Um, do you have recommendations on how they might be able to to deter some uh, some mosquitoes and not impact the butterflies? Uh, what do you, are they saying? Butterfly or mo mosquitoes attack butterflies? Um, I'm assuming they're just wanting to keep like keep mosquitoes out of their yard or something, um, oh. but not affect other insect populations. Oh, okay. It, it, just well, if you have any recommendations on that, any extensive spraying. Uh, in your yard is is none of it is specific to mosquitoes despite some of these companies that go around now I guess I probably can't name names but they go around and they spray for mosquitoes and that spray is indiscriminate it's going to kill all your bugs 
that it reaches. So I'm very much against that. Uh, and butterflies are, um, if you're out walking in the prairie and the mosquitoes are bothering you, di um, uh, not dioxin. <laughs> oh, what's the pesticide or, or what is it? Oh, who knows that? The, the really popular bug spray for bug repellent. I can't remember the name now. Um, but yeah, in the yards, it's, it's tough because uh, I don't know. I just wouldn't recommend spraying because you're killing everything. Yeah, a and lot of people are saying, were you meaning DEET or permethrin? Permethrin, yeah, that's it. Okay. Thank you. That, that, that's uh, any permethrin based uh, bug repellents uh, will do really good on your clothing to kill ticks, especially ticks, because ticks can be really horrible. Uh, yeah, and I'll, um, in that follow-up email tomorrow, we all send a link to some information from um, Ed Spivak with the St. Louis Zoo did a presentation on um, native flies and, and gardening for native flies, and he mentioned um, mosquitoes and some natural ways you can uh, work on mosquito populations in your yard, things like not having open water, um, things like that. So I think with um, that has hit most of the big questions we came, uh, that came in. Again, I mean, most of these, I'm filing through lots of messages of people that loved this presentation that um, uh, are excited about your book or loved your book or excited to hear more from you. Um, <laughs> so, so thank you for this. And we're all really excited about your, um, your intro to Beatles. Uh, webinar that's coming up soon um, that we'll send more information about that tomorrow in that email along with the recording. So yes, I see lots of, yes, more Betsy, more Betsy. So, <laughs> okay, the Beetle one. Yeah, I like the Beetle one. Here. <laughs> the, uh, awesome. Beetle well, well, Betsy, so thank fun. you again, and we'll send this info out and um, as well as all these titles you've mentioned here that folks can um, reference. Any, any parting thoughts for the group? Ah, just get out there. I think I have a, there you go. So just get out and have many enjoyable outings in nature's, including your own yard. And don't worry if you can't name it. Uh, eventually, if you're really interested, you will. But just important things, just get out and enjoy nature. Great, great words, advice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time, Betsy. Um, so you have a good evening and we'll, we'll see everybody on the next webinar. Okay. Thank you. Thanks all for all of you listening. <laughs>